Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this very special E colloquium. Uh, we have our distinguished speaker today, who is the uh, lecturer, Professor David Shea from Stanford. Um, we are pleased to welcome him here to the uh, colloquium. Uh, the Dean Lytle Lecture Series, uh, as you know, uh, is a premier event in the EE department. And as a part of the Dean Lecture Lytle Series, the speaker also gives a colloquium. Um, to introduce uh, Professor David Shea, uh, he is very well known as a distinguished researcher in the field of communication and signal processing. Um, over the period of many years, he has won best paper awards uh, across different societies from signal processing, communication, and the jo uh, information theory, and the joint information theory and communication best paper awards. He's also known as a distinguished educator, having won the Fr uh, Frederick uh, Emmons Sturman Award from the American Society of Engineering Education, and is also well known for his textbook on the fundamentals of wireless communication, which is used as a graduate textbook around the world. Um, in, in, uh, he's also made contributions to engineering practice, being the, co uh, the inventor of the proportional fire scheduler, which is used in almost all 3G and 4G cell phones today. Um, I'm, uh, I'm also pleased to say that he has been my postdoctoral advisor and a great mentor. Uh, our, our own faculty, uh, Boss and Jang, is also, uh, was also his PhD student at uh, Berkeley before he moved to Stanford. Um, today, he's going to talk about uh, uh, haplotype facing convolutional codes and community detection. Uh, in his very own style, this brings together three different areas, one on the um, uh, communication, the other computational biology, and the third social networks. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Devich. Uh, thank you very much, Sriram, for the kind introduction. Um, so if you don't know what these three words, three terms means, I hope by the end of the lecture at least you understand what these three things are. Uh, as uh, Sriram put it very well, this, uh, this talk is about these three subjects that uh, comes from three different fields. And uh, the goal of this talk is to sort of try to understand the connection between the three. Uh, but our original motivation of this uh, work is the haplotype phasing problem. So when I do research, I usually like to start from a concrete engineering problem and then go from there. So that's sort of the mindset we have for this work as well. So um, for people who were at my lecture yesterday, uh, as I said, a lot of my work in the past few years is motivated from this curve. So what does this curve show uh, in case people who were not here yesterday? How can you not be here yesterday, right? You're, every one of you must have been here yesterday, right? OK, good, all right. So, but just in case, you know, people do get busy. Um, oh, wow, there's a lot of people coming. <laughs> OK, so the high throughput sequencing revolution corresponds to the revolution of being able to sequence genomes. So in electrical engineering, we have been used to this line called the Morse law. So this Morse law is what drives electrical engineering in some sense. Uh, but on the other side of the road, literally on our side of the road, uh, in various schools, in, including University of Washington, the medical schools on the other side of the road, we have another curve going in parallel. And this curve is the cost of sequencing a genome. It went from $100 million when it was first done 15 years ago to um, now close to 1K. Okay, so this is 2014. There's actually a more updated plot with 2015. And you see that there's a last dip there to go close to 1K. Okay, so uh, this curve is what motivated me in doing research in this area because if there's such a huge technological growth, then there should be something interesting. Uh, this curve also shows one thing, which is when the country invests a lot of money here to sequence a human genome, a single one. This leads to this whole curve going down like this. Because when you can demonstrate that you can do something really hard, then people will think of many different ways of doing it in an easier way. And that's what we see this curve saying. So this curve, I think, is interesting, although it's shown basically in most of these talks. But I still think it's very interesting. OK, so let me explain to you the haplotype phasing problem. 
So to explain this problem, it involves a few new terminology, perhaps not that familiar with for electric engineers, but bear with me a little bit because you need to know, we need to know the language a little bit to able to understand why the problem is interesting. So every one of us has uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, almost every one of us. Um, they are of different length, okay? Um, so just a scale, so the chromosome are number from one to 22 and then the sex chromosome the, in order of length. The longest one is chromosome number one. It has 256 million uh, symbols, base pair, AGCT, that's the DNA. Okay, down to the shortest one, which is uh, 50 million, 50 million base pair, okay? Uh, so haplotype, what is haplotype? Haplotype in Greek means basic, something basic, something fundamental. And it's saying that we are actually consist of a pair of chromosomes. Each of these pair is called haplotype. One from the mother, maternal, and one from the father, paternal, okay? All right, so let's look at uh, a picture of your mom. This is a picture of your mom. <laughs> and this is a picture of your dad, okay? All right. Now, do they look similar to you, the, your father and your mother? They usually don't look very similar, right, usually. But uh, if you look at the genome, actually they're almost identical. They're almost identical. In fact, the genome of any two random human being is almost identical. Th down to, say, of the order of 0.1% differences only. But there are differences. Okay, so the first test of this talk I heard it's a course, right? It's a course. A course should have a test. And the first test is what are the name, the differences between your mom and your dad? Where is the first difference? I actually made it easy for you by adding a little bit of color. Here is the first difference. You see a C here and you see a T here, okay? So that's one difference. There's a second difference. Here there's a T and here there's a G, okay? All right, so in this whole, this is one stretch of, this is a real chromosome, this is a real genome. It's from one stretch of, uh, I think, chromosome number one. Uh, you see only two differences out of a few, I think this is of the order of a thousand symbols, okay? All right, so that's basically the picture. Two chromosomes, almost identical. But the word almost is important because it is not identical. The fact that they're not identical is very important because these so-called variations, in other words, differences, is, contains a lot of very useful information. Information about, for example, predicting susceptibility to certain diseases, for example, there is a, and these things are called single nucleotide polymorphism, SNP for short, SMP. Okay, so this SMP is not SNP, sorry, it was a joke, okay, it's SNP, and uh, there are differences. And whenever people want to sequence a genome, they want to essentially know what differences do you have? What are the variations do you have? For example, there's a um, SNP response for breast cancer, BRCA, okay? That, when you have it, is a very strong predictor that you will get breast cancer. So that's very important information. Okay, so that's the setup, okay? That's the ground truth. Now, what's the haplotype phasing problem? Okay, the haplotype phasing problem is to basically try to figure out the sequence of SNP on each of the pair. Okay, so in terms of this picture, the, the information I need is not only the fact that you have a variation, but I'm interested also on how the variations are paired up. So in other words, I wanna know whether the C here and the T here is on the same side of the family, or C and G here is the same side of the family. So the reason is because these SNPs often act in cooperation. So knowing that you have a variation on a position, it's not enough information. You want to know whether all the variations are happening on the father's side, or all the variations are happening on the mother's side, and so forth, okay? So the phasing problem is to try to figure out this information, okay? So 
Let us draw by a very simplified picture. Of course, I'm not going to show this, this sequence, right? I'm not going to show this sequence throughout my talk, thank God. But I'm going to shorthand it. And I'm going to just focus on the points in which there are differences, OK? So you can imagine there's a pre-processing step to this that I figure out, OK, so there are variations at certain positions. OK, this is called SNP calling. And this is the first step often in the bioinformatics pipeline. So I'm assuming you've done that already. And you figure out that, OK, in these four positions, there are SNPs. However, I don't know whether which guy has, which, whether mom or dad has a particular SNP. So zero, you can think of as essentially no variation, normal. One is variation. And basically, I want to figure out this sequence, OK? 0, 0, 1, 1 in that case, OK? Now, at the end, there's still some ambiguity here, is that I don't know whether the 0, 0, 1, 1 will be the mom or the father side, but that's less important. The more important problem is to just figure out the sequence, OK? Now, so is that clear? Is that clear what the problem is? OK, so I want to figure out the sequence of variation on each of the mother and father side. Now, where is the data? OK, so to infer this information, I need data. And the data is from high throughput sequencing. So that's the curve there, OK? So with the cheaper and cheaper cost of high throughput sequencing, this is becoming a more and more important way of doing this phasing. Traditionally, there are other ways of doing phasing, much slower, much harder, using indirect information only. But high throughput sequencing gives us direct information. And that's what I want to focus on today. So what is high throughput sequencing? It is a process of generating many, many short reads, OK? randomly scattered on the genome. That's high throughput sequencing data. The reads are very short, typically of a few hundred base pair or a few hundred symbols long. Okay, so how do I use these reads okay, to do phasing? Well, the first step is that the reads are aligned to a reference genome. So as I said, almost all human beings have sim very similar genome. Okay, so on, in a database, there are reference genomes high quality reference genome to represent a typical human individual. Using that, I can align the reads, OK? So if you were at my talk yesterday, yesterday I was focusing on the de novo problem. In other words, assemb assembling a new species where there's no reference. Here, there's a reference. It's easier problem, because then I can map the reads to a reference genome and figure out you know, I have these hundreds of millions of reads. I need to know which, where they come from. With a reference, I can map it there, and I can figure out with high accuracy where the read comes from, OK? All right? And that provides information about SNP, OK? So that's the picture. I take a read. I take a read, and I map it to a reference genome. So I now know that this read sits here. And from the value of the read, which is the data, I know that, hey, there's a 0 or 1 here, depending on whether this read comes from chromosome 1 or chromosome 1 prime. So just one clarification is that these reads come from either chromosome 1 or chromosome 1 prime. I don't know. So in other words, I don't know whether this read is blue or red. It doesn't come with a color. OK, the reads don't come with color. That's why it's black. So let's look at the, some numbers here, OK? First, the read length, how long these guys are, is 100. BPS, BPS is not bits per second, is base pairs. But I'll just call each of this symbol a base pair. So this is the measure of length on the genome. And the typical inter-SNP distance is about of the order of 1,000 base pairs. Why? Because we only have, remember, very, very few differences. So the difference, the, the distance between two variations or two SNP is very far away, of the order of a few thousand. OK, so tell me. Now to make sure that you have not fallen asleep, with this data, can I do phasing? Is there information there for phasing? I have a large number of reads. I have mapped the reads, and I know where they come from in the genome already. Can I do phasing? Well, let's think about it. Number one is that each read only comes from one of the two chromosomes. I have no idea which one. Okay. So I don't know which chromosome each read comes from, OK? Second, 
there is no linking information. In other words, this read is so short that it cannot stretch over to the other position. So if I had a longer read, I would at least know that, oh, OK, I see a 1, 0. So a 1 is linked to a 0, the JSON slip. But I have no such information because the reads are so short. OK? So what I really need is linking information. And fortunately, there's a technology which produces these reads called may pair reads, which provide this linking information to me. OK? So typically, what you do when you sequence is actually you get a fragment, OK? And then the sequencing machine reads this fragment from both ends. So this example here. So therefore, the reads often, in certain pr sample preparation, comes in a pair, OK? So this is paired with this. This is paired with this, OK? And the pairs are long enough so that they're roughly a, thou a few thousand base pair away. So this is the distribution of the length of the distances. It's of the order of a few thousand. Unfortunately, you cannot see it very clearly here for some reason. But it's of the order of a few thousand, OK? So now, therefore, each pair of these reads are a few snips apart, OK? Now, this can provide some linking information, right? Remember, what I need was linking information. That's the key word. To link the snips so that I know, so that I know whether the 1 is linked to a 0 or 1 is linked to a 1, OK? Now, remember, the reason I still don't know which color they are. But I know that in a may pair read, they must all be the same color. That's the information. Because when you sequence this thing, the whole fragment is actually coming from one of the two chromosomes. And so when you read it from both ends, you're actually getting information either from the mother's side, both from the mother's side, or both from the father's side. I don't know which side, but I do know it's from the same side. OK? I'll run through a few examples. And by, if you're still confused at that point, please do ask me to clarify. OK? So here's an example that I want to run through to get a feel, feeling of the data that we get here. OK? So remember, I have chromosome 1 and 1 prime. OK? Now, this is a may pair read. OK? It, the first, the left read, get mapped to this position around 0. OK? Remember, the reason why I can map this read is because this thing has a lot of context, right? That, the stuff that I throw out. That context was used to map the read. So I see a 0, and I see a 1. Now remember, this thing doesn't have a color from the point of view of the algorithm. It's a color only for your purpose to help you out. So say that this pair actually comes from the red. You can see 0 or 1, OK? Good? Now. Here's another pair. This pair spans two adjacent SNP. And the reason why some of them are short and some of them are long is because the insert size is random, as we show in that plot. OK, so sometimes you may get two adjacent guys. Sometimes you may get a skip one. Sometimes you may skip two. OK? All right. Now, here's another read, this time from chromosome 1 prime, blue guy. And you see a 1 here. Hey, but this 1 becomes a 0. What happened here, man? Well, like everything in the world, there are errors. Okay? Every measurement machine, every measurement tool, there are errors. And that makes us really exciting. Because we're here, communication people, trying to deal with errors. That's our reason of existence. And uh, so we see an error here, and we get very excited. Okay? These sequencing machines do have errors. Okay? Depending on what kind of sequencing machines, the error ra range may go from 1% to 15%. Okay? All right. So here is another read, 1-1, one, one, and the 0 becomes a 1, so another example error. OK. All right. So at this point, are you, do you get a feel of the problem? We're getting linkage. We're getting linkage between positions. OK? And now we want to infer from all these reads the sequence. That is the inf inference problem. This is a computational biology problem. It's also an inference problem, like many problems in the world. 
Any question at this point? Yes. Good question for you. So these are quaternary base pairs. I, I'm not supposed to walk over there, sorry. <laughs> so, so since these are quaternary pairs, shouldn't we have four symbol, I mean, two bits? Sorry? So each base pair is a quarter, ATGC, right? So I, I'm curious. Yes, why the, the reason why I call it zero or one is because, I, I, sorry, it's not a stupid question, it's a very valid question because I missed one point set to say one thing, which is typically in a SNP, okay? There's something called a major allele. That is a typical value, say A. And then the variation is typically another value. And so here, I went, so I only care about all the four values, only two values. And, I, and the biologists know these values. So the typical value I call zero, and the atypical one, which is the exception, I call it one. That's why it became zero, one. So that's why I care. So I quantized, if you move away, four values to two values. Okay, good. Yes? Where do the mate pairs come from? So the mate pair is this pairing, okay? Yeah. This, so reads are, say, of length 100, okay? But because I read, I, when I sequence a fragment, what I get is a fragment first. The fragment is of length, say, a few thousand. And what the sequencing machine do is it reads from one end, and it reads 100 symbols. And then the errors become so bad that it stops reading, and it generate one read. And now it reads from the other end, it gets 100 symbols, and then that's the other read. So I get two reads, and these two reads give me the value zero here and the value one here. Same chromosome, same chromosome. The most important thing is same chromosome. Red is one chromosome, is the maternal chromosome. Blue is the paternal chromosome. Okay? All right? Okay, so that's the problem. So now we're done with the biology, and now we have an engineering problem. In fact, we have an inference problem. Okay? All right. So question, so now we can put on a hat as a communication person or a machine learning public person, whatever you want to call yourself. But the natural question, there are only two, basically, for all these problems. One is how can I effic efficiently phase the data from the may pair reads, okay? How do I do it? Two is how much data do I need? In other words, how deep do I have the sequence? How many reads do I have to obtain? In order that I can reliably reconstruct. Well, the two questions are obviously related because if you use a good algorithm, then you can get by with a small number of reads. If you use a bad algorithm, then you can get by with a poor number of reads. But from an information theory point of view, the question I'm interested in is how can I get by with the minimal number of reads and can I do it in a computationally efficient way to get to the limit? So in the jargon of this field, it's called the information theory limit. And the question is whether the computational limit hits the information theory limits. OK? All right. So this problem has been looked at uh, by a few groups, OK? By a few groups. It turns out that the algorithm to solve this problem on first sight is actually pretty easy, which I'll explain very quickly. And this obtained by he and L. And another group with uh, Vicarlo and Vishwanath in Texas also considered a very similar problem, but there's difference, okay? And I'll explain the difference as I go along, okay? All right, so for, let me explain the model now. The model is the following. So I have a total of n SNPs. So I want you to re remember a few variables. I'm very bad at remembering variables in talks, so I try to minimize the number of variables. So n throughout the talk will be the number of SNPs. Think about it of the order of 100,000, okay? So I want to sequence the sequence of SNPs. The sequence is length 100,000. I, I sample through my sequencing process k may pair reads, okay? And each of these reads are ID randomly sampled from the chromosome, okay? The left end of the may pair is uniformly located among the n SNPs. So each pair is randomly sampled uniformly from all my SNP positions. But the left and right end of each may pair read are separated by W SNPs. Okay? So W, as we observe, is a random variable. For example, it could be one, it could be two. All right? So let's go back to the example. 
And let's figure out, for this may pair read, what is W? Two, right? For this may pair read, is it this one? I don't know what, what, which one's next. Hopefully this is next. What is W? One. OK. All right, so now, good. People are following. All right. You can never assume anything when you lecture, you know? You could be talking for an hour and nobody understands what the hell you're talking about. That has happened to me many times. OK? You know, I'm an information theorist. I know that you can communicate. So there's a joke for information theorists, right? Is that there's a capacity to a channel, but someone very famous said one day, said, hey, you know what? I figured out how to communicate, transmit information above capacity. Is that like, what? How could that happen? This guy's really famous, so people didn't laugh at him, but they were really curious. And the answer is, well, yes, but I haven't figured out how to decode information yet. Okay, so, you know, transmission is one thing. Decoding is a totally separate story. All right. Um, so, now, let's distinguish ourselves from the earlier work, from the UT Austin group, okay? So in the formulation of the same problem, there's a one key difference, which is they assume that the two ends of the May pair are independently chosen from the entire chromosome, okay? So that means they have global linking, linkage, global, okay? That is not very good physically. And the reason is, as I said, the May pairs are typically separated of the order of a few thousand base pair. A, a SNP is separated by about 1,000 SNP uh, base pair. So that means each linkage only span a few SNPs of the order of a few SNPs, okay? Whereas there are a total of 100,000 SNP on the chromosome. So this is not a good model. So we decided not to go that route and which move to another route. In the other route, I would like to model W as just some fixed distribution, independent of N. So N could be very large, but W is like with probability one third equals to one, with probability one third equals to two, and with probability one third equals to three, and that's it, okay? So I take a very different point of view. If you took this point of view where W is of the order of N, uh, a natural approach is to form it as a noisy matrix completion problem. Okay, uh, but our approach takes us a different path. The funny thing is that as we finish off this different path, we find that actually there's some interesting connection to this path, which I'll explain, explain in the second part of the talk, but I'm still in the first part of the talk. Okay, so here's the thing. This may Paris is actually code. Now, a code is something that a communication person gets really excited about because we spent quite a lot of years thinking about codes. But it's a code. Why is it a code? Well, if you think about it, what are we, what's the information we're seeking? The information we're seeking is the sequence on the red or equivalently the blue, the maternal, right? But we don't care which is which as long as we get the sequence. So in fact, the information we're seeking is all the parities in other words, the differences between adjacent SNP. If I figure out all the parities, then I'm done. What does a measurement give me? What does a may pair read give me? Well, it causes information. It is a function of these parities. So let's understand what this code really is. So here's back to our example. Okay. So I don't know what happened here. Ah, oh, right. Let's look at this may pair read. It's telling me that you have a zero here and a one here, and all I care is parity. So this is telling me that the parity between these two guys is a one, right? Yes? But the parity between these two guys, how does that depend on the parity between the adjacent SNP? It's just a sum. So this is nothing but give me a sum of two bits that I want to look for. And these reads give me directly the parity, okay? So actually, it's a code. It actually has this structure in the example earlier. First, it gives me the parity directly with the short distance in the example. 
And then it gives me the sum of Ln minus 1 plus L1, the sum of two parity. Because I have this translation invariance, in other words, the reads are obtained uniformly along the whole chromosome, I have a invariant structure which is described by a chain, linear time invariant system. Okay? So this is a code. What's the name of this code? Convolutional code. This is a convolutional code. Okay? So Li is the parity between SNP i and i plus 1. A may parity with W equals 1 gives me Li directly. And a may parity with W equals 2 gives me the sum of two adjacent parities. It's a convolutional code. Okay? So it's a convolutional code. Okay. As I said yesterday, <laughs> Shannon always likes to have a figure in his hey papers. So I'm no Shannon, of course. But hey, I can put a figure in my paper as well. All right. So here's a figure one of this problem. So every problem in my mind, every problem that's worth working on, has a, a sh sh have a figure. If you have no figure, then I don't know. <laughs> so here's a figure one. I start with the information I'm interested in, the SNP parities. I pass it through a convolutional code, OK? Now, however, what I observe is not directly the output of this convolutional code, but there's some kind of repetition. Because, you know, given a particular position, I may get multiple reads, right? Because I may hit it several times, because I'm getting a random measuring process. And that can be modeled very well as a Poisson random variable. So let's call it Poisson repetition. So I'm, I'm seeing the same pair several times because maybe I'm sampling many times. And then this passes through a noisy channel because the bits that I measure may be wrong. OK, so this is a setup. So the answer to our two questions. Number one, how do I decode? What's the algorithm I should use? Well, if you have a convolutional code, then the answer is? Vertebrae decoding, OK? So a vertebrae decoder is also the maximum likely decoder here. It's optimal, optimal, OK? All right, the second question, all right? Now you figure out the structure, OK? The answer, the second question is, well, what's the capacity of this problem? Now, it's a bit strange because if you look at figure one, it is a little bit different from Shannon's figure that I talked about yesterday. OK? Now that people who have missed the talk yesterday really, really wish that they were there yesterday. Too bad. Too late. In the figure yesterday, we have an encoder here and a decoder here. But the encoder and decoder is free to choose by the engineer. Here, because of the sequencing technology that I'm using, the code is actually fixed for me already. It's a convolutional code. It's fixed for me. It's not something I can choose. It turns out to be quite common in computational biology problem that the encoder is fixed for you or very little degrees of freedom. You may be able to choose between technology number one and technology number two, which may have slightly different code, but you don't really have full degree of freedom in optimizing as much as you choose. So this is, in some sense, asking the capacity of this system with a convolutional code fixed for you already. But it's OK. You can ask that question, too. OK. Yes? Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It's no different. Yeah. Because the Poisson number is known already, so it's not a random variable here to be estimated. Yes, so the number of repetition I get. So if you have a fixed number of repetition, you can still do Viterbi. You just do a majority vote on the edge, and then you pass that to the Viterbi. So it's very similar to the Viterbi. It is a Viterbi, but it's just uh, the likelihood. You just have to calculate a little bit carefully. So Poisson number is the same thing. OK, so it, this problem is uh, you can do this for any channel. But for the problem we're interested in, the channel can be modeled very well by a binary symmetric channel. In other words, it's a flip. When you make a measurement with probability p, you may make an error. OK? And we can analyze the capacity of this. So what does it mean by capacity for this? OK? 
Well, first, it means that we're interested in a very large number of SNPs. When we talk about capacity, we're usually dealing with many SNPs, OK? And N is 100,000, so it's pretty large. So we're pretty happy with that. Now, second, capacity means what's the minimum number of bits you can get, or the maximum number of bits you can get per measurement. But if you reverse the problem, you can ask the same thing, which is, what's the minimal number of measurements you need to phase the N symbols? And this is the expression, OK? So we figured that out. So this expression, what does this expression mean? First of all, optimal number. It doesn't mean that this is exactly the optimal number for a given N. It means asymptotically, when N is large, this is the limit in the sense that if you try to do the problem for a number of reads which is smaller than that, your probability error will be very large. Once it's above that, then your probability error will be driven to zero of reconstruction, okay? Like what we define for capacity, all right? So let's look at this expression a little bit to get some insight, okay? The first term, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, D here is the divergence between two Bernoulli random variable A and B is given by this expression, okay? All right. So now let's look back at this expression. First of all, what is n log n is a number that appears all the time in high throughput sequencing. n log n is basically the number of reads you need to collect in order to make sure that each SNP position gets at least one read. OK, so if you have, remember from your basic probability, there's a problem that occur, occurs a lot in basic probability called the coupon collection problem, OK? The coupon collection problem is that you're randomly sampling and you want to collect all the SNPs. But because you're randomly sampling, there's always a chance that you collect many, many samples, but you're still missing a very few number of them. To get those very few number, you need an extra log n term. You need extra log n term to basically to sequence enough to see all the SNP with high probability. So even without errors, you need at least that many, OK? Now, this number is less than 1, so this number tells you that you need actually more than the coverage. So this is called the minimum coverage. Let's call it that way. And so this number is, you can think of as the repetition loss. So it's, in other words, if you only have a pure repetition code, then you will be taking this loss, OK? And this number is the convolutional coding gain. So this number, OK, is always between 1 and 2. It says that you don't have to lose as much as the convolutional code, uh, repetition loss, because you have a code there. But the code is actually not a very good code. So it's always between 1 and 2. OK? Yeah? Uh, if w equals 1 with probability 1, yes. then this number is still that's That's fine. That's enough information for you to decode. Yes. Yes, so there is a minor assumption here. That is, the W support should be, there should be no holes in the support W. For example, you cannot say that W is only even. If W is only even, then you cannot reconstruct because you broke up the problem into two parts. So I'm making a minor assumption here, which is uh, reasonable, I think, that W has a support which has no gaps. OK? Yeah? So the analogy to coupon collection, that stops when you have one example of a coupon. So, but here you're reconstructing. You just don't want one read of every step, right? Yeah. So you need a bit more uh, by this constant. Yes. So it turns out that if you need a bunch of read per position, you don't need you only need a constant factor of n log n. So in other words, coupon collection, you're already doing a lot of work to get that. Once you have that, you already have actually many reads in many positions, but you need an additional factor to correct for the errors, basically. OK? All right. So um, this curve is basically the number of reads increase as a function of p. So I normalize everything to the noise, the noise-free case. This curve only tells me how many more reads as a multiple of the basic case of noise-free do I need as a function of error? So you can see that as the error rate gets large, this thing this increases astronomically, actually. It's pr pretty bad. But for low error rate, okay, 
is not too bad. And at 15%, your coverage needed is about, uh, about 10 times, about eight or 10 times. So that's quite serious impact of the error, okay? I'll show more of this curve later on, it's a bit clearer. This one is not that clear. Okay, all right, so now I finished the basic result, and now I'm gonna move on to connecting this with the community detection problem, okay? But before I do that, is there any more questions? Yes? You assumed a uniform distribution of the reads. Yes. We know that there are parts of the chromosomes that are harder to sequence than others. How does that change the, 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 the expectation of your model? Yes, so that is one extension that we meant to do but have not done yet. Uh, to a first approximation, one can think of uh, this result as applying to, instead of the whole chromosome, blocks. So in other words, you're gonna get some gaps in which since you cannot sequence the read, it's very hard to phase across that gap. So you break down into blocks, and you can think of these results as only applying to each block as opposed to the whole thing. But uh, we are, at this point, have not done enough study on the data to see whether you can actually connect through the whole thing or not. But that's a valid question. Thank you. Okay. Yes? So your error seems to be just assuming that everything is stochastic, that these, these errors are changing. But we also know that, that um, I would say most of the errors are not uh, stochastic. They're correlated errors. They're artifacts in the data. Have you looked into how that, your model fits with those sorts of phenomena? Uh, no, we have not, but that's a good question. Uh, definitely, that would be a good next step. It also depends on the sequencing technology. So for some sequencing technology, the errors are pretty random. For example, there's a technology called PacBio, and in fact, we are um, thinking about using this idea to do PacBio phasing. The errors are pretty independent, pretty random, but in Illumina, it's true that errors are a little bit context dependent, so it's correlated. Okay, all right. So, I want to make a connection to another field called community detection. And I'm making this connection not just for the fun of it, but actually to solve an extension of the basic problem, okay? So first, let me make the connection and then I'll talk about what extension I want to pursue. So, if you think about this problem, it's basically part of this, okay? You have a graph and then you obtain noisy measurement of the labels on the graph, okay? So you can think of this as the instance of a community detection problem. So what's a community detection problem? Is that you have a huge number of nodes, okay? And just imagine concretely, suppose you have two community of people, okay? And between community, across community, there's you know, very little interaction or very less interaction. But within community, you have a lot of interaction. And what you make measurement is some evidence of the interaction. But these are measurements, so they're noisy. So when two persons interact, you really don't know whether they're really within the same community or cross community, but you can measure them. And from the measurement, you want to infer or cluster these two communities, okay? So this problem has been looked at by many, many different fields, actually and has received a lot of recent attention, particularly recent, but a long history, actually. Um, and basically, our problem, the blue, the two communities are basically my zeros and ones in the sequence. The zero is one community, the one is another community, and I want to figure who is zero and who is one, basically, okay? All right, now, there's a big difference, though, between our problem and the general problem that people looked at. So in most works, the measurement is on a complete graph, okay? So basically the setup that people have is the following. You have a complete graph, that is every node is connected to every other node, and then you do some random sampling on this com uh, complete graph, okay? So some edges get sampled and you get a measurement on them. Some edges do not get sampled, you get an edge on, you do not get any measurement. But the measurements are random the global across the whole graph, okay? And you remember what I discussed from, with the UT Austin uh, results, they are essentially following 
this paradigm of a complete graph. But as we saw from the actual numbers, that model is not very good because the measurements are actually local, in a local neighborhood. So actually, the picture we have is this, OK? So the SNPs are along the chromosome. So this is the line of the chromosome, OK? And here, I have edges. The edges are places where I can make measurements, OK? So this example where W, remember the W is a separation, is a uniform random variable on 1, 2, 3, OK? Uniform either 1 or 2 or 3. So I draw an edge for each node to the adjacent node. This is 1. A second edge here, which is 2. And a third edge, which is 3, OK? And for every node, I do the same. So this whole thing is like translation invariant. And this is the convolutional coding structure as well. And the measurements I make are Poisson samples of the number of measurements on each edge, okay, following a Poisson number of measurements. Now, notice that there is no edge from this node to this node in the middle of the chromosome. Right? Why? Because my reads cannot span. The linking information cannot span that far. Okay? So therefore, this graph tells you that there is actually a lot of local structure very different from this fully connected graph. OK? So that's the nature of the problem. But actually, I think this is a more general phenomenon, is that in a lot of community detection problems, in a lot of graphs, there's actually quite a bit of local structure. Because you are much more likely to be friends, maybe, for people who are around you than for people in a different country. So perhaps this has some bearing on that type of problem as well. But our focus is really on our problem. Okay. All right? So this is the graph for our problem, OK? Local connectivity. Now, this graph actually has a way where you can use this graph representation to interpret, actually, the result that we had earlier. In particular, for a communication engineer or an information theorist, one very important question that one asked when you analyze a communication system is what is the typical way in which errors happen? Because once you figure out where typical errors happen, then you can focus on that bottleneck. So that's a very important thing. And using this graph, we can actually see the typical error events as cuts. So let me explain why. So let's take an example where W is equal to 1 always. So you only get adjacent SNP measurements. What does the graph look like before I show it? Sorry? It's a line. Only a line. No other edges. OK? So what's the cut in this graph? It's trivial. You just cut it across any edge. So there's only one, one cut, really. OK? Now, if you look at this cut, it says that you, when you make an error, you make an error along this edge. So in other words, you're making measurement, <clears throat> and you make an error. OK? So for example, you want to wait until you get a, a five measurements, and you do a majority vote. And somehow you're unlucky, and your majority vote turns out to be the wrong answer. Then you make an error. So suppose this is the ground truth sequence, just to sim simplify the problem. Because this is a convolutional code, so you can take the all zero input anyway. Of course, in reality, we're not interested in all zero input so much, but let's just focus on all zero. Now tell me, if you make an error use of this edge, then what will happen to the de decoding? Well, you get all these guys wrong. And you get one. Because this is a parity, right? Because you now think that there's a uh, difference between this guy and this guy. So you make it all wrong. Okay? So this is a bad situation. But this is a typical error event in the case of w equals to 1. Okay? Now, suppose now W is uniform on 1, 2, 3, the graph we showed earlier. OK, now it's a little bit more complicated, because now there are multiple cuts that you can draw in this graph. Let's use the same cut here. Okay, Tell me how many edges go through this cut. OK, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Six edges. OK? Now, there's another cut here which is around a particular node. Let's count. 
How many edges are there in this cut? One, two, three, four, five, six. Also six. So these two cuts are actually tied at the min cut. And you can show that these two are the main cut of six, OK? Now, if you count the number of cuts, then let's look at what happens when W becomes larger, OK? W becomes larger. That means there's more connectivity. Which cut do you think will dominate? Let's roughly count. This is the number of cut, this cut size is proportional to the range of W. So if W goes from 1, 2, 3 to 1, 2, 3, 4, then it becomes, you know, four, four, instead of six, eight. But this one is actually quadratic in the range of W. So as soon as W gets bigger than the range one, two, three, then this cut dominates, okay? Okay? And this cut means what? It means that a single error is made. Now, this cut is actually much better than this cut because you only make one error, actually. All the other guys are correct, OK? So this is exactly the dichotomy in our result. If you remember our result, there's a minimum of EW and 2. So it turns out that if EW is less than 2, then this cut dominates. If expectation of W is greater than 2, then this cut dominates. When it's equal to 2, which is this example, it's a tie, OK? But in most cases of interest, actually, expectation of W is greater than or equal to 2, OK? So a single error is typical. So this is a typical error event. And I want you to bear that in mind in the next few minutes, OK? Now, so now I have understood the connection with community detection. And now we'll use this connection to solve other problems. So it turns out that there are now emergent new sequencing technology just came out a few months ago, actually. OK? Now, if you think about it, the mate pair link, the mate pairs, so remember, the data links the reads. And the linking read are at a few snips apart, say of the order of 4 to 8 to 10, at most 10. OK? There is an emergent technology which can link read as much larger distance apart. That's what we're interested in right now. So we just, for example, there's a company, OK, which just announced only a few months ago called 10x. This is not like 10x, it's 10x, OK? This technology can link reads at about 100 SNPs apart, much further. It's of the length of about 50k base pair or 100k base pair, which translates to about 100 SNPs apart. It uses a technology called barcoding. So basically, it barcodes the reads to tell you that they come from essentially the same side of the chromosome although they're very far apart, OK? So we want to now develop algorithms to solve this problem, OK? Now, let's try to understand what is the problem with using our existing approach to solve this problem. First, one thing is that 100 is still much less than 100,000. So you still have locality, OK? But Viterbi decoding does not scale. Viterbi decoding is exponential in the constraint length. So if you have now a constraint length of about of the order of 100, then there's no hope of using Viterbi decoding. Okay? So we need to seek another algorithm, and we need to ask whether that algorithm, can we find a good algorithm for that problem. So Viterbi is an easy algorithm because it's maximum likelihood. When you can implement it, it's the optimal. However, if it's now of the order of 100 constraint length, then you cannot use Viterbi decoding. You cannot do maximum likelihood. Now you have to have a suboptimal decoding algorithm. And the question is, is the suboptimal decoding algorithm close to the information theoretic limit? That's the question we ask. To ask this question, we formulate an asymptotic scaling uh, regime called intermediate connectivity. So remember this picture again. And this W is basically the range of spread, OK? So now I'm going to model W is uniform on 1, 2, up to a certain number. But I let this number scale with n, n to the beta, where beta is between 0 and 1. So this scaling contains a very wide range of parameter range. And so it allows me to study this problem. For example, when beta equals 0, it's just back to the local problem that I started with. 
When beta equals one, you have connectivity all over the graph. That is the complete graph. In a 10x technology, you can plug in the numbers, and that gives you beta of the order of 0.4. So that means the scaling is giving you roughly the right numbers here. It's not like 0.01. It's not like 0.99, okay? All right, so now we want to study this problem. And this regime is uh, one thing which is important for us is that you can't use Viterbi, right? Because Viterbi is now in time exponential in n to the power beta. Okay, so the main result we showed. First, we characterize the information theoretic limit for this regime. Okay, the optimal number of reads for phasing is a similar expression, except that this pre-constant looks like this. Minimum of half comma beta, okay? Second, the computational limit. Viterbi doesn't work, and maximum likelihood doesn't work. However, we show that you can achieve this limit using the algorithm which is almost linear in n. Although Viterbi doesn't work, although maximum likelihood doesn't work, okay? Okay, so that is the sample complexity picture as a function of beta. So I'm scaling the number of reads to be to the case when beta equals zero. That is the case we studied. And this is a factor of the number of reads I need. For beta less than 0.5, it's exactly the same number of reads, exactly the same number of reads as the local, entirely local case. When beta becomes between 0.5 and 1, it crops up to a factor of two times the number of reads. Okay, so this is the plot. Now you may ask, okay, so what happens if beta equals to 1? Right, beta equals to 1 is the fully connected graph. That is the case that people studied. In fact, Hayek, Wu, and Su had a result on that, and they showed that the limit is equal to this, okay? So this curve is actually discontinuous at beta equals to one. We got kind of puzzled. If you have a discontinuous curve, you better understand why is it discontinuous. Otherwise, your result is probably wrong. Uh, so that's what's happened here. Let's look at our graph again. When beta is less than 0.5, and beta between 0.5 and 1, there's one crucial difference. So what's happening on this thing? If you look at this very long, then there's a little bit of difference between the guys on the edge, on the boundary, versus the guys in the middle, because these guys actually have no connectivity to this side. When beta is less than 0.5, these guys are very few in numbers, so they don't matter. When beta is between 0.5 and 1, actually these guys become a significant part of the number of nodes, and they matter. When beta equals to one, these guys become everybody. So again, it doesn't matter. Okay, so that's the reason for a result. Okay, so very quickly, the algorithm. Okay, this is a bit technical. First, we run the spectral method, i.e. PCA, with rounding, on a core subgraph of size n to the beta to achieve approximate recovery. So this is now getting a bit technical. But our approximate recovery essentially means that you recover 99% of the nodes. Not 100%, but 99%. So it's the first step. Second, you grow from your core to do approximate recovery of all the other nodes. Okay? Stage three, you come back and go and clean up every node, each node, by a majority vote from its neighbor. So it's like iterative decoding, but just one step. You take a majority vote from all your neighbors only and stop. And that's it. This algorithm is efficient because the spectral method, you can do power method, is almost linear, and all the other steps are linear, okay? And uh, just to show some simulations uh, for beta equals 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 for 100,000 SNP, we run this algorithm, and we see that as we increase the number of reads from left to right, the dotted line is the information theory limit, and we can see that the probability of error goes from, sorry, the probability of correctness goes from zero, jumps to one, pretty much close to the information theory limit, both for beta equals 0.4 and beta equals 0.6, using the algorithm. It takes about 15 seconds to run genome, genome scale. This is genome scale, 100,000. So we're quite happy about that, and we really want to try this on some real data. So just quickly finish. Uh, so when you have a maximum likelihood problem that you cannot solve, but you can solve using a suboptimal method and hit the information theory limit, 
You should always ask yourself, is there some intuition? What's happening here? So here's some intuition. First, exact recovery takes order n log n reads, right? We already seen that because of the coupon collection phenomenon. However, you can show, and people have shown, that approximate recovery only needs order n reads. So the bottleneck is actually not in the approximate recovery part because it only needs very few reads compared to the actual number of reads you have. So therefore, that gives us a lot of slack. And that allows us to solve the approximate recovery problem very easily. So the key bottleneck is really how to get from the approximate recovery to exact recovery. Now, that one is actually pretty easy also. And the reason is because the typical error event, remember, for exact recovery, is when there's only one error, right? So in other words, you get almost all the network correctly, and your error is happening at one node. But if you have most of the guys correctly, then the cleanup step, which is averaging from the neighborhood, is exactly what you need. And that solves the bottleneck event. And so it gets you to the exact recovery. So the computational complexity, efficiency, of approximate recovery would imply efficient exact recovery. So our whole problem is reduced to essentially approximate recovery. And people have shown that the spectral method can solve that problem quite well. OK. So I'll skip this part. Turns out you can use this curve to evaluate other technologies as well. But I'm running out of time. So let me just conclude. OK. One, our focus is studying the information limits of haplotype phasing. We connect this to convolutional decoding, a classic communication problem, and community detection, a more modern problem. And then we show that information limits can be achieved very efficiently in all parameter regimes. So if you remember the end of my talk yesterday, I said that we often get lucky. By just looking at information limits, you will sometimes get computational limits also for free. Sometimes, not all the time. But here's another example. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Say, for that great talk. Uh, we'll take a couple of questions. Yes, please. So, okay, channel information, fissure information. In parameter estimation, it's fissure information that matters, which is a second moment of a fissure score. In channel information, it's the first moment of a log likelihood random variable. Why should these types of problems favor channel information? Right, so first of all, uh, neither Fisher information nor Shannon information turns out to be the right measure for this problem. If you look at that expression, it's actually called the Balachari parameter. Because here, again, Shannon information only makes sense if you allow your encoder and decoder to be fully flexible. Okay? So here, I'm only doing a very restricted code. And so the error events that drive it is very different from the Shannon error events. And so Shannon information does not appear in the answer here. So as I said yesterday, I said one cannot apply blindly an information measure from one problem to another problem. The information measure must come from the intrinsic nature of that problem. And so for a different problem, you have different information measure. So I'm not wedded to, although you know, Shannon is mine, obviously. I like him quite a bit. But I'm not wedded to any measure that he came up with. I'm just wedded to his kind of thinking, I guess. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, Sumit. Yes, Sumit. Do I have to make up a big term of which of these you think I should? Coupon collection. Coupon collection. Have a, have a problem there. I can supply you with a few if you want to. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, I have a question myself. <laughs> OK. In some problems in community detection, it's known that the statistical and the computational limits don't match. What is special about this problem? That OK, so for most two community problems, they match. Now, there is a problem called a planted clique problem, where you only have one community sitting 
somewhere in there, which are cliques, so they are very close friends to each other, but they are not so good friends with all the, the rest of the world. That problem, there's a gap, for example. So here is a two community problem. So in some sense, the fact that we have no gap, if you show it to experts in this area, they, are not, they will not be very surprised. However, I emphasize that we do have a different graph structure, which is local graph structure. Um, okay, with that, we'll conclude the talk. Thank you very much for coming, and thanks, Professor David Schultz.